In our last few videos, we focused quite a bit on the ways in which we sense. In this video, I want to turn our attention to the ways in which we perceive. I'm going to start with some general terminology, some general interesting aspects of our perception, before then turning more specifically to the Gestalt principles, the main focus of this video. And I'm going to start with a distinction between bottom-up processing and top-down processing. These terms are a little confusing and abstract at first, but I'm going to go over a demonstration on the following slide which should make this a lot more clear. Bottom-up processing is simply perceiving the parts and using those parts to create the whole. So you're simply starting at the bottom and working your way up. You're taking whatever sensory information is given to you, and you're trying to piece that sensory information together in a way that creates an experience. Top-down processing works the opposite way. This is where you have beliefs and expectations about what you're perceiving to begin with, and those beliefs and expectations guide your interpretation of the parts, of the sensory information that you're given. So essentially you're starting at the top, these high-level beliefs and expectations, and then you're working your way back down to those individual parts. Again, let's make this a little more clear via a demonstration. I'm going to play an audio clip and we'll talk about it. All right, what did you just hear? Well, if you're like most people, you probably can't really make out what was being said. This is called sine wave speech and it's a little bit difficult to understand. Let me play it one more time and I encourage you to cherish this moment because I'm going to do something in a minute that will forever change the way you perceive this audio clip. Let's listen to it again. Okay, now listen to this. The man read the newspaper at lunchtime. The man read the newspaper at lunchtime. Now let's take one last listen to that original audio clip. Pretty freaky, right? Chances are after I gave you this top level belief or expectation about what the sine wave speech was saying, then when we heard that original audio clip, you heard the man read the newspaper at lunchtime. And you can even go back and rewind this video as many times as you want. Now for the rest of your life, whenever you hear that audio clip, you're always going to hear the man read the newspaper at lunchtime. I told you to cherish that moment of not knowing what was being said because that's gone forever. Now I really want to make the terms clear. In the beginning you were using bottom up processing. You had no belief no expectations about what the sine wave speech was saying, and so it was very difficult to understand uh, the top level stuff, what was being said, and you couldn't really make it out. After I gave you that top level belief or expectation about what was being said, you were able to engage in that top down processing and understand the sine wave speech. Here's another example of top down processing. What do you see here? Well, chances are you would read off ABC, but imagine what you would have said had I shown you this and asked you again the same question, you probably would have said 12, 13, 14. Pretty simple example, but the idea is, again, your expectations or your beliefs guided by the external context surrounding this middle object changes your interpretation of that middle object. In either case, the sensory information you're getting is the same, but if I sort of surround that object with an A and a C, you're gonna tell me something very different about what that object is, rather than when I surround that object with a 12 and a 14. This is an example also of what we call perceptual hypotheses. Perceptual hypotheses are simply educated guesses that we make while interpreting sensory information, which can often be ambiguous. And by making these educated guesses, these hypotheses, what we generate is a perceptual set. Perceptual set is a predisposition to perceive things in a certain way, which are again driven by our expectations or our hypotheses about what we're perceiving. A lot of terminology, a lot of jargon, but the ideas are really simple. Here's an object, uh, or an image I should say, that you've probably seen something like before. This is called a bistable image because there are two ways to interpret it. But imagine had I labeled this and I said two faces, right, and that was the label for this image, you'd probably focus on the two faces. That would be your perceptual set and that would guide your interpretation of the image. If instead I said nice vase with a V, then you would probably see, you know, the white vase in the middle and the other two black faces might sort of fade into the background. Then I'm changing your perceptual set. As one last sort of topic, which I find super fascinating before turning to the Gestalt principles, I want to talk about perceptual constancy. Perceptual constancy, as the name implies, is simply the idea that we perceive stimuli consistently across varied conditions. And there are lots of different forms of perceptual constancy. I'm going to talk about two. 
color constancy, and size constancy. I'll give you a quick demo of each, and by doing so, I hope you'll better understand what I mean by perceptual constancy. Let's talk first about color constancy. All right, here's an image, and here's the question for you. What colors are A and B? I don't mean the actual letters A and B, I mean the boxes, the checkers that surround the letter. If you're like most people, you probably would say that A is sort of a dark gray, and B is more of a light gray. But what if I were to tell you that these two boxes are actually the same identical color? And let me prove it to you by sort of taking away all the surrounding contextual information that your brain is using mistakenly to get a different answer. Okay, I'm not playing any tricks, I didn't change the original image, but look, now when I get rid of all that surrounding information, A and B are identical. And I can even go back and forth over and over. Let me try and do that. Oops. One more time. Okay, there we go. A couple times, back and forth, back and forth. Again, I'm not playing any tricks, I'm not changing A or B, but uh, essentially what's happening is your brain is using the contextual information. Specifically, your brain actually sees, in the beginning, right, in terms of what it senses, it sees that A and B are the same color, but then it notices that B is surrounded by a shadow. It's in a shadow. So if A and B are the same color visually, but B is in a shadow, B must actually be lighter. Again, it's confusing. We're sort of taking advantage of these little perceptual uh, heuristics and rules that your brain follows in order to play an illusion on you. Here's this other one I kind of uh, gave away a little too soon. This is an example of size constancy, a really simple example that you've seen a million times in your everyday life. A door at different angles takes up different amounts of space or sizes on your visual field. On the left, we have obviously much more space being taken than on the right, there's much less being, uh, space being taken. But chances are in either case, any all three of these cases, you're gonna say that it's a door, it's a regular sized door. And again, you're gonna perceive the size of this object as constant across these varied conditions. All right, let's shift gears to talk about the Gestalt principles. Gestalt psychology is a whole field of psychology that starts with the assumption that the brain creates a perception that is more than simply the sum of the available sensory inputs. So it's more than the sum of the parts you're given. There are principles called the Gestalt principles that guide the way your brains interpret sensory information in predictable ways. And for the rest of this video, I'm gonna tell you some of these Gestalt principles to illustrate what Gestalt psychology is all about, because it tells us some really interesting things about the ways we perceive. The first Gestalt principle is known as proximity. This is the idea that objects that are closer together tend to go together. If you look at the left side of the screen, for example, you would probably perceive this whole object as a single object, right? One big square of dots. In contrast, if you look at the right side of the screen, you'll probably perceive this as three individual rectangles because I've added space in between each of these uh, sort of lines, right? So I'm decreasing the proximity on the right-hand side of the screen, and as a result, you tend to see them as different kinds of objects. This illustrates the principle of proximity. Next, we have the principle of similarity. This is the principle which states, again, it's a principle that describes the ways in which our brains work. So this isn't people just coming up with this. These are biases that we have in the ways we as humans perceive things. Similarity states that similar things tend to go together more than dissimilar things. So chances are in this image here, you're not seeing one big rectangle anymore, right? Chances are you're seeing lines because I've basically altered the color such that I make lines, horizontal lines, similar to one another. Now, you probably really didn't look at vertical lines, okay? Because that would be very dissimilar objects that uh, wouldn't feel like they really go together. All right. Next is the principle of continuity. This is the idea that we're more likely to perceive continuous, smooth-flowing lines rather than jagged, broken lines, as you're seeing here. Next, we have the principle of closure. This is the idea that we organize our perceptions into complete objects rather than as a series of disconnected parts. So here you probably see, what, a circle and a rectangle. Chances are, no matter who I ask, no human being would say, oh, I see a bunch of random disconnected lines, right? No, most people are gonna say, I see a circle and a rectangle, even though there are a bunch of gaps, and in reality, a bunch of disconnected lines is a better description of the sensory input you're getting, but because of the Gestalt principle of closure, we say circle and rectangle. Next, we have symmetry. Symmetrical objects are more likely to be arranged as wholes rather than non-symmetrical objects. 
On the left, you would probably say that this looks like one object, even though there is a gap in between them and technically it's two separate objects. On the right, you'd probably say definitely two separate objects, right? Because they're not symmetrical. They don't appear to go together. Last but not least, we have the Gestalt principle of figure ground. And we've kind of seen this already, but it is in fact a Gestalt principle. This is the idea that we make an instantaneous decision to focus our attention on what we believe to be the central figure, either the faces or the vase with a V, and we largely ignore what we believe to be the background. 